Good morning, folks. Gorgeous plasma filaments dancing here in the ionized helium view of 304 angstroms. We've got weather and top science news, and we are starting with our star at spaceweathernews.com. The last day on the sun was dominated by coronal holes. The solar wind is due at Earth within the next 24 to 36 hours, and the next coronal hole coming is now visible on the south on the left. The current solar wind stream at Earth is tremendously weak. The last few streams have been like this, leaving geomagnetic conditions very low, but also just up off the floor every few hours. Quick earthquake note on how fast the alert zones can whip around. After we showed the blood echo surge in South America yesterday, it went silent, with the remainder of the ring of fire lighting up. Some alert zones can enter and leave a region within just hours. Much more information on that at quakewatch.net. Up next, the southeastern U.S. Tornadoes tore through the country yesterday morning and into the afternoon and evening hours. Multiple events with others just being strong wind events. And as of this morning, there's really no way to tell the total damage or number dead as some twisters march dozens of miles on the ground. Here's what it looked like in the cloud phase distinction and lightning overlays from GOES. You should be able to see the air descending southward behind the storm as well. That's the cold. Jet stream is cocked, and here comes another record-breaking cold and snow event. It's number eight on the season, still four days from the official start of winter. Up next is Radio Jupiter. The lowest electromagnetic wavelength spectrum does indeed paint the Leviathan just as beautiful as her colorful swirling clouds might appear to our eyes. And 10 points if you can figure out what this is before I say it. Yes, we are still at Jupiter, and they are aiming for radio waves still, but the radio waves emitted by electrons caught in magnetic fields. Jupiter is in the middle with a powerful planetary electromagnetic shield around it and its plasma torus, which we discussed with Io yesterday, as the brightest white dots on the side as we're looking through the densest line of sight in the torus there. Scaling up to the jet effects, at galactic scale of the Taurus jet model, and of course, thanks to three of the national labs, we know those are magnetically driven too. NGC 1175 has a central X, just like many galaxies we see, and even the Milky Way. Playing with the light here to reveal the structure, which not only has an invisible vertical component blasting away from the poles, but the transition from poloidal fields to toroidal fields is what looks like diamonds on either side. They do indeed wrap all the way around and once more, we're just seeing the thickest points from our perspective. And speaking of perspective, the newest UV technology is able to peer through the ever-before-obscuring deep space dust to pick out brand new stars in super-old galaxies, some up to a hundred times the mass of the Milky Way. Generations of stars interspersed together. And now we're going towards the center of our own galaxy and focusing on the visible and infrared wavelengths. They have discovered an ancient starburst in the Milky Way that surged star formation to 100 solar masses a year, whereas we're currently standing around one or two in the Milky Way now. One of the best things they do in the article and videos is compare the wavelength views. So for example, if this is what we'd be lucky to see with our eyes or the previous generation scopes, the gorgeous colors of dust and gases re-emitting photoionization energy from the surrounding stars shines brightest in that infrared view. And they went ahead and tossed the new Vista image on there for the same region so that we can understand that just because our eyes see the visible wavelengths doesn't mean we see them that well. Last but not least, icing on the cake. Not only does space weather from host stars present a habitability risk for many exoplanets, but the key aspects might be the atmospheric thickness and the strength of the planetary magnetic field rather than a simple function of their distance from the star, what they call the habitable zone. And folks, this reminds us that when Earth loses its shield, things get somewhat uninhabitable around this planet. This topic was one I nervously got into initially via emails and published pieces, with a Harvard professor claiming the magnetic reversals of Earth were no big deal, and he got it published in the Astrophysical Journal. The journal protected him and refused to even send our key response out for review, and then, one month later it came, the number one geophysics journal on Earth stamping out the conversation and definitively linking these events to not only trouble, but extinction level events. The lead author, James Channel, earned an entire episode of Earth Catastrophe Cycle for the great interview he was kind enough to do with us. And of course, the number one geophysics journal on Earth was enough, but it's nice to see the same magnetospheric habitability concept once again here. 
And lastly, folks, I have indeed decided to post the paper I tried to submit against the Harvard professor initially. They kept giving me instructions on how to edit and revise, and after thrice following their request to a T, they said they were not going to publish it or even send it out to be reviewed. Even though it's no longer needed and we won the argument, sharing is still fun and this paper I tried to send in is in the link list below with all the others. We greatly appreciate your support. We've got wind map forecasts and shots of our star to close. And of course, we'll do this all again tomorrow, right here. But right now, it's 4.20 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open, no fear. Be safe, everyone.